now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. It is 8.06 on O'Connor and Company. Thanks for tuning in here. It's our big 8 o'clock hour. If you missed any of our first three hours, well, I mean, we missed you, but we're glad you're here now. Why don't you subscribe to the podcast and download it and listen because uh, it was pretty good. Good pretty to good catch stuff. up. Yeah, right? In the meantime, coming up in this hour, 30 minutes from now, we'll speak with Larry Hogan, who, uh, if you're in Maryland right now, he would love your consideration for the U.S. Senate election coming up this November. So we'll uh, ask him several questions coming up in 30 minutes. I'm Larry O'Connor alongside Julie Gunlock. Good morning. Good morning to you, Julie. Um, Yesterday, we had a bit of an update on the mystery surrounding the royal family. Uh, It's not just the Kate Middleton story although she is a central figure in the mysteries surrounding the family, but also Charles and uh, other aspects of what's going on there. But, but, the, but the crux of it is, where is Kate Middleton? What is going on? She really hasn't been seen in any official way since mid-December. We're told that she had a medical procedure. Have we been told exactly what that medical procedure was? Abdominal is the only thing they'll Abdominal say. Abdominal procedure. Abdominal, which is another way of saying facelift. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's nowhere near the abdomen. <clears throat> okay. Enough said. Yes. Um, and and so there have been rumors. Yes. And and the couple of pictures that they have put out of her, one of them when she was in the back of a car, and it looks like, I mean, you, you, you know that famous um, eight millimeter video of Bigfoot, which right. of course is just a guy in an ape suit, but it's right. like the shaky camera yeah, and everything's blurry. That was blurry. a clear picture compared to, yes. That was high definition right. compared to the right. Kate Middleton picture of her sitting everything's in a car. Everything's been a little fuzzy, including these latest photos. Well, and then, well, there was a photoshopped photo of yes. her that they put out Which that was she, clearly a fraudulent she picture. Fa- she took the fall for that. So yesterday there was a sighting, and I think it must have been in reaction to our conversation where I, we were pointing out the- right. obviously. The uh, odd appearance of the of the alleged yes. uh, third other woman. Yes, there, there's an allegation that William has had an affair with a woman. Well, who, you have who... to understand, it's not just that. I mean, there were the, the conspiracies and rumors have gone bonkers. Right. Of course, this is all Megan's fault, and um, she's <laughs> fueling these that. rumors. Blame the Yank. Um, yeah, and uh, there was a rumor that Prince. I'm sorry, King Charles died. Right, on that was Patrick's that was Day. the Sunday rumor. There was um there, and then there were rumors that Kate died, <laughs> and then there were rumors about the affair, about the affair with the woman who looks Rose like Kate Middleton, Chumley or but, Marchioness of Chumley, right? Who looks like Kate Middleton, but with kind of a horsey face. This is why you're constantly talking about horses. Well, because the sighting yesterday, a but, lot of British people look like horses. That's true. Yeah, it's and, not. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, not just British. I mean, the royal family. Hey, rein it in. Sorry, it's a horse reference. So anyway, William and Kate were seen yesterday, finally, out in public together. Yeah, just acting another like ev- grainy everything's photo. Everything's fine. And where were they? Where were they? At a saddle shop. They were buying <laughs> horse equipment. <laughs> which, of course, is just adding fodder I mean, to the... Mm. See, you didn't let that one go by. You're having hay with this. Is I, uh, I, am, I am making hay. Making hay. I'm making, making hay. hay with it. Let's try it. All right. Sorry. Uh, I don't bridle at these kind of puns if I have to. <laughs> um, but what do you think of the? Because now, I mean, a- a- Andy Cohen, who uh, of course does the Bravo TV show, who An loves to horrible person, dwell in this gossip stuff. Yeah, uh, he tweeted up the he uh, loves story. putting women against women, and he said that ain't Kate. Kind of like what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, he, he doesn't think that's Kate Middleton. It, it, do you look, think it's Kate Middleton? Well, and there've been all these. You know, manipulations of the photo, putting another, obviously putting another face on the sort of grainy photo of Kate. The still shot looks like her. Yeah, look. But the video does not look like her. Yes, it does. And honestly, it is her. And I mean, I love how we're supposed to believe these altered photos (laughs) where they literally put another face on the body and uh, and say, oh, see, I and the the people say I cleaned up the photo. I, I made it not so blurry. And look, it's not her. Okay, it's her. But uh, she I've, looks really. Uh, she just looks very thin. But she was she, does, she, she was walking at a rapid she's pace. She's always been thin. Yeah, she has always been thin. She did look like she had energy. Yeah, and she was like. Yes. And I, I love how the I love how the tabloids write this stuff. Uh, Kate Middleton proved naysayers wrong when she was seen looking happy and healthy. <laughs> 
while visiting a local farm stand with her husband. Yeah, but everybody acts like she went to the Safeway because everyone's like, why is she at the grocery store? This is a farm stand, a very, you know, sort of bougie farm stand on the grounds of Windsor. Okay, it's not like the giant. You're right. Okay, down the road. Yeah, but still, it's not like that. They have people who go shopping for them, well, right? Yeah. I mean, look, the, the, they have tried to be somewhat normal. They have talked about that, trying to give their children a normal life. Yeah. So. Maybe this is a little bit of that. You don't but also, think that I think there's that, some kind of there's pressure for her to like be show a public face. I am not the only one who has said that the alleged other woman has uh, equine like features. All right, I'm not the only one. This is a thing. This is a meme. It's a pattern of, of slightly larger teeth. Commentary. No chin. Right. Right. Um. Why the long face? <laughs> you know. So she's finally seen. Buying horse supplies I know. at the farm stand, and get this: there is a new report they out. Act like she walked out with a like a saddle, okay? <laughs> they might sell. goes up to the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Wilbur. <laughs> um, but now there's a report out that Kate Middleton, wait for it, is allergic to horses. Ooh, now just really. put the pieces together here. Here, I've drawn out a chart. It's right here. Do you follow the red strings on the wall? You can see exactly what this means. <clears throat> uh, I believe that she is allergic to horses. So why are they buying horse supplies? She wasn't at the buying farm horse store? supplies. There's no evidence that it was horse supplies. They walked out with a bag. Right. You act like she walks out with a bridle and a saddle. <laughs> no, Williams handling that part of it, <laughs> or he goes bareback. Who knows? Okay, all right. All right. So there's another article here about how uh, if it's Sunday Times in the UK. Uh, putting out a story about all of the speculation and rumors about their marriage being very cruel, that it's very hard for them to have to do. It's all Megan's fault. Why? Why? Given the fact that his mother, Diana, had to deal with all this stuff and it was all Drake, why does he even pay attention to this? Why would he? Yeah, I don't know. Honestly, it's like, and I know it's weird when you watch The Crown, if it is accurate, which it isn't. I mean, it's accurate, but it's not a documentary. But the royal family is constantly looking at the press, constantly looking at the newspapers, constantly reading the tabloids. And they sort of it, it plays a big part. And they certainly use the press and the tabloids to boost yeah. themselves up. But apparently this is all of the speculation and all of the rumors and all of the gossip. It really is, is putting a strain on them. And, well, they, and you worry about that. You do worry about that. They are a public figure. They are public figures. Right. And they probably check their media and they have media professionals uh, that – make them aware of these things but i think you're right you just well look i don't i don't know it's my obligation by the way as a freedom freedom loving american to say we don't really care about this it means nothing to us it's fun to make fun of them yes but of course we care about it we're obsessed with it we We are as obsessed as as the british are look you know they have set themselves up to be you know private people they want to give their children some semblance of normalcy um but it's hard in, in this day and age, and they are the royal family, and you know they do have a public role. So I think when they go super quiet like this and sort of disappear and aren't necessarily forthcoming about what's gone on, nobody knows what kind of surgery he had. Right. We're very we're, people are in the dark about King Charles's condition, and we are we as a culture have become used to um, too much sharing, too much information. That's like, well, you've had a procedure. We want the details. Yeah. Why are you hiding the details yeah. of it? And now, no matter what they say, if they finally come clean, it will always be wrapped in this. Yes. Oh, but is that Which really gives the birth truth? To a thousand conspiracies, it but does. honestly, if they had been forthcoming, if they had been more honest, you know, if Kate had given this sort of you know Oprah like sit down. Would it stop the conspiracies? Would it stop no. the rumors? Well, no. Because it's just it the is, world they live in now. It's very odd. She, she goes and has surgery, a medical procedure, abdominal issues, and senior staff members, the people who like work with her every day, had no idea she had any health issues. Right. They found out about it after the fact in the press. Yeah. This is just... There's a... Yeah, it's bizarre. Well, we'll keep watching it. And we'll talk about it because other people are talking and about a, it. And, I, and the word abdomen abdominal yeah. surgery yeah i mean it could be anything it yeah. could be appendicitis like i had it mm. could be you know but it's obviously more serious because it requires how many months off i mean right. that's significant so we will we'll continue uh keeping you up to speed on it so that you know and and especially if we can f- make more jokes about the other woman who has you know certain distinctive characteristics yes. about her we will continue to be mean excellent <laughs> well not mean just catty yeah All right. It's 815 WMAL traffic and weather.
WMAL's Free Speech Forum is back Sunday, June 2nd at the Birchmere. Details online now at WMAL.com slash Free Speech Forum. Larry Hogan will be joining us coming up at 835. We'll ask him what he thinks about the disappearance of Kate Middleton. No, we won't. No, we probably won't. No, we won't. Although there is a very active horse culture there in Maryland, but we will not. <laughs> Yeah, what's the st- Speaking of Kate Middleton, what's happening with the sale of Pimlico and the restoration there for the Preakness? Uh, there's a new book out. It's a docu-series, actually. Excuse me, not a book. It's called Quiet on the Set. No, we have to be serious. This the is- Dark Side of Kids TV. It's a, airing on the Investigation Discovery Channel. Ugh. And it delves into... Oh, yeah. So uh, this delves into what went on behind the scenes during Nickelodeon shows that uh, either you or your kids watched in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, Drake and Josh, iCarly, Zoe 101, The Amanda Show, these were all staples in our household. Um, and I, I saw this so like three weeks ago, I think. Drake and Josh and another actress from one of the shows, they had a podcast, and they talked about um, the story of this guy, uh, Dan Schneider, creator and executive producer of those shows. He was then later investigated by Viacom CBS. No evidence of misconduct was found. He uh, parted ways with Nickelodeon in 2018 as the Me Too movement was ramping up. Mm. 30-plus years, Dan worked with thousands of people, many of whom still tell him how much they enjoyed and appreciated working on his shows, but he also knows some people did not have a positive experience, according to Schneider's spokesman. Yeah, not a positive experience is an understatement. The docuseries uh, tells stories about a Nickelodeon production assistant named Jason Handy, I believe he also appeared as like a bit actor in some of these shows. Mm -hmm. Uh, He allegedly sent an 11-year-old child actress naked pictures of himself. Mm. He was later arrested in 2003 for possession of sexually explicit images of children. His diary declared that he was a self-described pedophile. How do people like this get on to shows like this? uh, And how are they not monitored? How are uh, Well, if anybody who works on a show with children should be monitored. That actually is the law. I've worked with children in the entertainment industry in California before, and there are strict rules here. Yeah. But these rules are just pushed Uh, aside. Especially if the show is profitable. Look at Amanda Bynes. She was a Nickelodeon star. Now she's struggling struggling with her her mental health. You you look at these children who were in it. Britney Spears. I mean, all all of these kids. Jamie Lynn Spears. the, the, The rare story is a child actor who emerges from Hollywood and has a somewhat normal life. This goes back to Shirley Temple. Yeah. Shirley Temple Black would tell stories about what what happened to her when she was a child actress. Uh, Oh, it's on and on. Uh, Here is Drake Bell, 14 years old at the time when this stuff happened, talking about his experience with this production assistant. He had this really cool house with all of this Hollywood memorabilia, and it was just a house you wanted to live in. He just seemed like... Any other nice coworker, mm. you know, at that point. Brian and I became really close because we had a lot of the same interests, which, looking back, I think that was probably a little calculated. You hear a scuttlebutt about the business and what you got to watch your kids and this and that. So I was very attentive. Yeah, I don't know if that's the parent, um, but there, <laughs> you have to be attentive. But still, he talks about you know having a sleepover at 14 years old with an adult. Uh, and no, you just don't do that. Yeah, and I can tell you, the, parents have access yes. everywhere on set. That's the law, and they can't exclude a parent from the set. Let alone, and a parent certainly doesn't have to acquiesce to these the very do. inappropriate relationships, but do. They, do they do because parents love the idea of their kid being a star, despite the fact that, again, Dana Plato, uh, uh, I mean, how many child stars who have had these tragic endings yeah. do you have to see? To well, just and, say, and again, it is fame by virtue of being the parent of this yep. famous person. Parents, we've seen this with the trans movement. It's sort of this Munchausen thing where... Parents can then essentially uh, tie themselves right. Their to child's, their child's fame is their struggle fame. Yep. and their child's intersectionality. Um, we have a real crisis of parenting in this country, and part of that is this sort of 
closeness to fame or closeness to victimhood um, that parents are seeking. So it's the same problem in Hollywood of parents turning a blind eye to the abuse. If it comes with fame, it's okay. It's a, it's it's really disturbing. And by the way, at least three known people accused or convicted of 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 inappropriate sexual relations with children, with underage children, all working at Nickelodeon and on these shows. And what did CBS Viacom do to proactively get involved in this, prevent it, stop it? I got to sit through DEI training every quarter yeah. about what I'm allowed yeah. to say to somebody as when I at the when, at, get at, a cup of coffee. when I get a cup of coffee. But what did Viacom CBS do to proactively stop this? Stuff? What are they doing now to make amends for it? In fact, did you even hear about this? No, yeah. they used all their money and all of their power That's and right. all of their influence to kill these stories and to pretend like everything's just fine. Children's it's TV, it's great. It's awful. I'm looking forward to watching this series, even though it's disturbing. But it does tell you what's going on and the lies that we are being told. It's called Quiet on the Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV. It's 823. Now, now. on 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. A number of people have said uh, that they thought I could make a difference in the Senate and be a, a voice of uh, common sense and moderation. Uh, I was certainly humbled by that, and it gave me and my family a uh, reason to consider it. But as I have repeatedly said, I, I don't aspire to be a United States senator. Well, the Hogan's Heroes theme can only mean Larry Hogan is back here on WMAL, and we welcome him for a good conversation about his, well, change of heart, as you just heard him declining to run for Senate in 2022 against Chris Van Hollen. He is now, of course, running for Senate for that open seat, and he joins us now. Governor Hogan, thanks for joining us. Good morning, Larry. Thanks for the thanks for the uh, welcoming theme song. I, I was I was hoping you were going to play that. So what changed? You said you don't aspire to be a U.S. senator, and now you literally are aspiring to be a U.S. senator. What's different? Well, no, actually, nothing's changed at all. I, I still don't aspire to be a, a United States senator. I mean, what, what person in their right mind would uh, actually, you know, uh, want to go down there and be part of all that divisiveness and, and dysfunction? Uh, you know, I love being governor because I could get things done every single day. And in Washington, they don't ever seem to get anything done. And it's uh, 99 other people that are just arguing with it, with each other, never actually finding any solutions to problems. And so... It, look, I didn't need a job, and I wasn't looking for a title, and it wasn't uh, something I, I, you know, uh, I, that I needed to do for my, you know, myself. But I just was so frustrated and fed up with what was going on down there that I, I stepped up anyway because I think I do have some ability to go down there and try to make a difference. Well, and I admire that. Yet at the same time, I, personally, I'd rather Congress, uh, if the choice is between getting something destructive done. <laughs> Uh, versus getting nothing done, I'd rather them do nothing. And you told Luke Russ here at MSNBC that it was specifically the failure of the border bill, the bipartisan border bill, that made you decide to run for Senate because you thought Republicans should have passed that border. But can you tell me what what in that border bill actually would have fixed the border problem? Well, I'm not sure it would have fixed the border problem, but it was uh, 70 senators uh, supported this bill. And, uh, you know, it, it came off the rails at the last minute. I'm not saying... It was the best potential solution. But, you know, look, we've been complaining about trying to fix the border. And there was a border bill that was at least moving in the right direction and addressing some of the problem. And, uh, you know, you can't wait around and do nothing until you get the perfect bill. I mean, we ought to move forward. So I thought there were there were folks in the Senate that wanted to fund Ukraine and Israel and uh, try to secure the border. And, and, And now we have none of those problems solved. Do you think President Biden should just use his executive actions, which you know he has at his disposal as a former executive yourself, to secure the border himself? Well, there's no question that he can do uh, far more than he has done. It's been uh, their administration, the Biden administration, has been a complete failure. We absolutely uh, must secure and close the border. And uh, look, I think there's a this is one where Democrats and Republicans uh, you can't agree on everything, but there is a path forward. It starts with securing the border and then, as Ronald Reagan wanted to do, find a way to fix the broken immigration system. But you can't do that until step one is they ought to take every action possible to close the border rather than fighting with Texas over it. 
what they're trying to do. Many people would look at your uh, campaign here as the opportunity not just to have a Republican senator from Maryland, which would be, I think, a wonderful thing, uh, but also that you could be, you know, one of the Republicans that move the Senate back into a Republican majority uh, hands, which would be, which would also be a great thing because that Republican majority Senate will be part of hopefully moving the agenda of the new Republican president. But of course, Donald Trump is the presumptive nominee. Have you considered your role there in helping the newly inaugurated Republican president move his agenda in the U.S. Senate? Well, look, I, I think it's it's pretty clear where I stand on uh, on Donald Trump, and I've stood up when I disagreed with him. I, I supported him when I agreed with the policies. I'm not going there just. Uh, I'm not. I'm not running for the Senate just to help Donald Trump or to help uh, just for one party. I'm going there to fix the broken politics and the mess that's down there. But yeah, you know, look, it, it's, we're the bluest state in America. Uh, Donald Trump lost Maryland by 33 points. We haven't elected a. Republican senator from Maryland since 1980, when I was a chairman of Youth for Reagan. That's a long time. Uh, but I think we have a chance to go down there because, uh, you know, that when, I'm hoping to win the support of the 20 percent of the Marylanders who are Republicans, but also independents and discerning Democrats who are just frustrated, just as frustrated as I am about what's going on in Washington. I think the Republicans are likely to take the Senate back. There are 34 races. Ten of them are very competitive. Maryland is the toughest one in the country, so I don't I don't think that the control of the Senate hinges on me, but I think I can be a voice uh, to try to you know get things done like yeah. I did in Maryland when I had a seventy percent Democratic legislature and we were able to cut taxes eight years in a row and turn our economy around. Well, absolutely, and your track record as governor of Maryland with regard to taxes, with regard to expense, uh, spending, with regard to economic growth, uh, absolutely can't be debated. You were incredibly effective there. When you talk to voters now, is that their primary concern? Because, you know, we hear from people that, yes, the economy is important and it's horrible, but also their schools are failing them. The curriculum is failing them. The the yeah. policies that are being pushed down their throats right now by the left and, I, and um, not to mention yeah. crime in the streets and Commonwealth's attorneys yeah. and state's attorneys who are putting criminals back on the streets in the form of uh, in, under the guise of social justice. There's a lot more than just the economy now. Well, and all of those things are things that I fought for eight years and made a difference on. But, yes, you're right. I mean, we are, we're, the people in Maryland are concerned about the same things people around the rest of the country are concerned about. In Maryland, uh, right now, uh, you know, so I did, you know, I cut taxes eight years in a row by $4.7 billion. We took a $5 billion deficit, turned it into a $5 billion surplus. We turned Maryland's economy around uh, and went from 49th out of 50 states to number six, the biggest economic turnaround in America. Uh, and, but, and they are concerned about that as a top priority right now because the legislature currently, as we speak, is considering and discussing the largest tax increase in history. We had zero taxes for eight years. They're talking about a $4 billion increase in the sales tax, a tax on everyone and everything. They're talking about raising. We eliminated 350 fees and cut tolls in half. First time tolls were cut in 50 years. They're talking about reversing all of that. So no question as as inflation is out of control and the, the national economy, people are struggling to, struggling to pay their bills. And uh, in Maryland, they're, they're, they're talking about drastically increasing taxes, which will destroy Maryland's economy and cost us businesses and jobs. It, it, it's like Yogi Berra you know, it said, uh, you know, it's deja vu all over again. It's just like the O'Malley administration. So that's an issue. But on crime, as the far left was, uh, was you know, pandering with this crazy – idea of defund the police. I'm the first elected leader in America to stem, stand up and strongly speak out against it. I, I pushed a refund the police initiative, which is now being followed by other states. I was the first one in the country. We put a half a billion dollars more into state and local police, a 50 percent increase in state aid to police. Um, I pushed for tougher mandatory sentences for repeat violent offenders and, and for fe you know violent felons. Uh, we were battling left and right. You know, when the when the riots broke out in Baltimore, I immediately declared a state of emergency, sent 4,000 members of the National Guard and 1,000 police officers, and immediately stopped all the violence, and then walked the streets. I mean, those are the reasons why the people of Maryland support me. These are issues that the country is wrestling with that we've already taken action on. Our schools 
are a mess. I mean, we that's a battle going on in Annapolis and in Washington. And we put record amounts of money into education, but the kids are getting, you know, the, we're not getting the results. And, uh, you know, parents need to have more say. I push for more charter schools. We push for tr- uh, school choice. We started a program where we you know, were able to, not enough because my 70% legislature pushed back, but we we got, you know, got tens of thousands of kids into the private schools because we took them out of failing public schools um, and gave them an opportunity for the first time. But then all that money is so, yeah. used by school board members and school systems like in Montgomery County to uh, keep parents out of the loop for sex education courses. And they tell them, you know, p- parents aren't looking at public schools anymore saying we need to put more money in it. They get they got to yeah. want to have yeah. a say. They want to have a yeah. seat at the table. Montgomery County is yeah, keeping yeah. parents from being able to opt out of sex education mm-hmm. for elementary school kids. And, Governor, you know the stuff that's being taught in those sex ed classes. It's not like you and I learned when we were in eighth grade yeah no well i mean we had they would know i mean no almost nobody believes that we should be teaching any kind of sex stuff to kids young kids and i think it's you know parents are standing up and trying to get more of a say montgomery county is probably one of the worst not not just on that issue but i mean look we've got the border thing as a major issue and uh you know we've, we've got the county executive who refuses to cooperate with ice we were fighting you know, they were they were pushing for Maryland to be a sanctuary state, which I stopped and stood up and fought the legislature. But, uh, you know, we have a, I'm running against a guy who wants to close all the ICE detention centers, uh, who wrote a letter the day after a two year old was murdered by MS-13 in Langley Park. The day, next day, he sent a letter asking to close the, the ICE detention facilities. We, we just had a story where uh, somebody was teaching in Montgomery County who was deported twice and made his way back. He was already arrested last year on rape charges and Montgomery County let him out again a second time, refused to tell ICE or cooperate with ICE. Oh, we and know. He's been arrested for abusing children at the church. I mean, Montgomery County is, you know, wrong on an awful lot of things. And, uh, you know, the, the voters have a chance to, you know, not not vote for, uh, you know, the, the congressman there that he's taking those stands. And to not support the county executive who we fought with for eight years. Listen, I we, I would love to have a further conversation with you on sanctuary policies in the counties and, and what can be done at the yeah. federal level to stop it. We're out of time, sadly, but please come back. Yeah. There's so much more we want to hey, get thanks. to. See, and I'm nicer yeah, than Jake thanks. Tapper. You should be here more often. Come on, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Right. Well, thank you, Julie. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate it. All right, we'll, 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 we'll hear from you again soon, I hope. It's 848. <laughs> Let's get to Jamie Witt. 